All right, so that is supposedly running. And y'all can see the slides on the screen, correct? Yes. Yep. All right. So let me move some stuff around on my screen so I can still see it. And we will move on with things. All right, so um, I'm gonna run down the list of who I can see that has popped up on the participant list, but if there's anybody whose name I don't say, um, go ahead and let me know. So I see that we have Allison Coltrane, Tamara Nyegavon, Jack Meadows, Teresa Thompson, uh, myself, Matt Day, David Montgomery, Kent Jackson, Natasha Henderson, Matt Kitchen, Julie Bogle, BJ Grieve, Brandon Dawson, Brian Kluchar, Kathy Vollert, and Tom Tenike. Is there anybody on the call whose name I did not read off? Okay. Uh, so we do have a, a couple of uh, new names in that list. Um, I know Brandon Dawson is the new um, person taking over for uh, Chatham County's role on this committee. Uh, so welcome, Brandon. And then Natasha Henderson is a new uh, person working in the Transportation Planning Division at DOT. And so I think she's just here to observe today. Is that is that right, Natasha? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, and I think that's all the new folks we have. Okay, so we do have a quorum then? We do have a quorum. All right. Well, then we will call the meeting to order. It's 10.33 a.m. December 9th. So welcome everybody to the RTCC meeting. I'm Teresa Thompson, uh, chair of the committee. And going through the agenda, you want me to start with that? Sure. All right, um, so first on the agenda is purpose, the purpose of the meeting. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we do have two decision items on the agenda today. One is approval of a submittal for um, fiscal year 23 CMAC funding, and the other is approval of our 2022 meeting calendar. Uh, but we will probably spend the bulk of our time on the discussion items. Uh, those first two are, um, items that, that could take a while to talk about depending on, on how much discussion we want to have, so. Okay, so next on the agenda is public comment. <clears throat> so if there's anyone here that would like to speak, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. All right, so I don't think there's anyone here for public comment. Um, so now we're gonna go to the approval of the October 14th uh, minutes. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Okay, if not, do we have a motion to approve? This is Tom Tenike with Orange County. I'll make a motion to approve those minutes. Okay, thank you. And do we have a second? Dave Montgomery, I'll second. All right, thank you. Do we still need to do roll call, Matt? We do still have to do roll call, unfortunately. So I'm gonna read down the, the list of folks who are um, official voting members. And when I get to your name, if you would just say yes or no to indicate your vote. Uh, Jack Meadows. Matt, yes, sorry about that. No problem. Uh, Teresa Thompson. Yes. Matt Day, yes. David Montgomery. Yes. Julie Bogle. Yes. BJ Grieve. Hi, Captain Day. <laughs> uh, Brandon Dawson. Yes. Brian Kluchar. Yes. Tom Tenike. Yes. And I see that Joel Strickland has joined us. If you would also like to vote on approval of the minutes, you may. 
Yes. All right. Is there anybody else who's a voting member who has snuck in in the last minute or two and I didn't catch? Doesn't look like it. All right. So that um, passes unanimously. Okay. So we'll move on to item number five. We have two decision items. The first is the approval of the project submittal for fiscal year 23 for CMAC funding. Matt? All right. So um, every year TARPO does get um, some funding for uh, CMAC projects. These are funds that uh, have to be used on projects that are going to have an air quality benefit. Um, and they can only be used in areas that um, are either currently uh, failing the federal air quality standards or failed them in the past. So for our purposes, that includes Orange County and the four Northeastern townships of Chatham County. Um, so we uh, put out a call for project submittals uh, a few months ago, um, did receive one submittal from the town of Pittsburgh for a sidewalk project at the Pittsburgh Elementary School. Um, essentially, there's a gap in the sidewalk, uh, essentially right in front of the school. Uh, so you've got existing sidewalk on either side, but there's a gap um, and this project would fill that gap. And it, it was the only submitted project. Um, it would use up the uh, majority of the um, funding target that we had been given. We were given a target of $208,581 and the project is estimated at $206,100. Um, so uh, what staff is uh, recommending today is that the uh, TCAC recommend to the RTAC that they approve submittal of this project. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Matt? Okay, um, well, would someone like to make a motion to recommend approval? Uh, Teresa, yes. this is Jack, I'll make that motion. Okay, thank you, Jack. Is there a second? Yeah, Joel Strickland, I'll second it. All right, thank you, Joel. Roll call. All right. Jack Meadows. Yes. Teresa Thompson. Yes. Matt Day. Yes. David Montgomery. Yes. Julie Bogle. Yes. BJ Grieve. Yes. Brandon Dawson. Yes. Brian Kluchar. Yes. Tom Tenike. Yes. Joel Strickland. Yes. That is unanimous. All righty. So moving on to item 5B, <clears throat> approval of the 22 meeting calendar. Um, so this is an activity that we do every year uh, to approve the meeting calendar for the upcoming year. Um, I am recommending that we continue with our uh, current meeting schedule, which is to meet on the second Thursday of even numbered months. Uh, you can see the dates there on your screen for what uh, dates those would be. Um, as of right now, things are still up in the air as far as whether these would be in-person or virtual meetings. Um, so the way I wrote it was to uh, say, you know, they could be either but when we do get back to in-person, we would go back to our alternating, um, alternating between Pittsburgh location and Sanford location for our meetings as we did in the past. Um, and what we have typically done in the past, just to make sure we don't run into a situation where um, the RTCC approves one calendar and then the RTAC approves a different calendar, we have generally asked the RTCC to uh, make its motion essentially that you will agree to follow whatever calendar the RTAC approves. Um, and you can recommend that they approve this calendar, but that you will ultimately follow whatever calendar they approve. Okay. Does anyone have any comments or questions for Matt about the calendar? <clears throat> 
So what should the motion be then, Matt? So I believe, let me check the packet. Um, so what I've got in the recommendation in the packet is to recommend that the RTAC approve the 2022 meeting calendar with the provision that the RTCC meeting schedule will follow the calendar that is approved by the RTAC. Okay, thank you. Would someone like to make that motion? This is Brandon with Chatham oh. County. Oh, you go, BJ. Uh, BJ, did you make that motion? Yeah, I so said BJ Greaves, so <laughs> moved with the eloquent wording of Mr. Bay. Thank, thank you, BJ. And Brandon, you wanted to be second it? Yeah, I can second that. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I will do the roll call. Jack Meadows. Yes. Teresa Thompson. Yes. Matt Day. Yes. David Montgomery. Yes. Julie Bogle. Yes. BJ Grieve. Yes. Brandon Dawson. Yes. Brian Kluchar. Yes. Tom Tenike. Yes. Joel Strickland. Yes. That is unanimous approval. All right, moving along. Um, item number six, discussion items, we have four. And starting with 6A, it is to discuss the P6 scoring results. Matt, is that for you? That is for me. Okay. So um, I'm going to say up front that we can sort of spend as much or as little time on this as y'all want to. Uh, because it's interesting information, um, it's useful information, but it's not really critical information since the prioritization 6.0 project or process has been halted. Um, this, these uh, scoring results are not going to have any impact on the current um, STIP development process, uh, but they are certainly useful information as we think about what projects we might want to submit next time around when we get to prioritization seven. So um, NCDOT did agree that they would, even though the P6 process was stopped, that they would complete the quantitative scoring of all those P6 submitted projects uh, because most of the work was already done at the time it was stopped. Um, they just had a little bit of, of extra work to do to complete those. Uh, and they did finally release those uh, a few weeks ago. So what I've put in your packet is um, a table that shows all of the projects um, and it's organized by county so that you can easily find your county's projects. Um, and they're listed in rank order by their division needs score. So That'll usually line up also pretty well with their regional and statewide scores, uh, but not every project has a regional or statewide score. So they're, they're listed in order based on the division need scores. Um, so you can kind of see which of your projects did better than others. Um, I did also do a little bit of sort of really basic uh, statistical analysis that we're gonna look at here in a minute just to kind of see where our projects uh, stack up against the other projects that were submitted around the state. So this graph that you see on the screen, um, it, it's a little jumbled and hard to read, but the, the important thing to understand about this um, chart, what it's showing is each of those red dots represents a project score for a project that's within the TARPO area. And then what the little gray boxes show is the range of scores uh, that fell within the middle 50% of scores. So um, you, you see the two, there's two different shades of gray. So where it changes shades, that's the median score. Um, and then if you take everything that falls within those two boxes, that's the middle 50% of project scores. So this is kind of an easy way to pick out which of your projects scored in the top quarter or which of them scored in the bottom quarter. 
Um, and so you can see that, you know, we have a pretty reasonable spread of results on our TARPO projects. Um, we have some that are up in the top and we have some that are down in the bottom. And the next few slides kind of go through and, and identify which projects those are that fell out either in the top quarter or the bottom quarter. So um, looking at highway projects um, in the statewide category, we had two projects that fell in the top quarter, uh, meaning they, they scored really well. Um, and to be clear, we don't know in, in a theoretical sense what would have been a good enough score to get funded um, had there actually been money to fund projects in P6. So I'm kind of using top quarter and bottom quarter as a proxy for um, you know, what is a good scoring project versus a bad scoring project. Uh, so we had two that fell in the, the top quarter on statewide. That was the um, Super Street project at NC87 and Carolina Trace in Lee County and the interchange improvement at US1 and NC42 in Lee County. Then when you go to the uh, regional category, we didn't have any projects in region D that kind of fell outside of that, that middle 50%. Uh, but in region E, we had four projects that were in the top quarter. Uh, so the same two projects from statewide, plus um, the NC87 Super Street for the whole quarter, basically from the, the Sanford Walmart down to uh, the Harnett County line. Um, as well as a project in Aberdeen that was a, a new bridge to connect NC211 and Roseland Road directly. Uh, so those both scored pretty well. Um, but then we also had, uh, I believe, eight projects that fell in the bottom quarter. So that was um, kind of working from the, from the bottom up. Uh, our, our bottom scoring project there was the NC87 modernization improvements up in the northern part of Chatham County. Um, then we have the Midland Road improvements, um, NC87 modernization within Pittsburgh, uh, NC751 uh, modernization. That was actually a project that was mostly in the MPO area, but crossed over a, a little bit into the RPO. Um, NC2427 modernization. Um, US 421 and NC 902 interchange in Chatham County, uh, US 15501 and Deep River Road intersection improvements in Lee County. And then what I'm listing as US 421 Super Street, which was um, a proposal to do Super Street improvements basically on the, the whole stretch of 421 between uh, Siler City and Sanford. So that's sort of where they fell out. When we get down to the division level, um, it's kind of a similar situation, but in division seven, we do have one project um, on Lebanon Road in Orange County. Uh, that I believe, it was not submitted by us. I'm not sure if it was submitted by um, the Durham Chapel Hill Carborough MPO or by the Burlington Graham MPO, because it's kind of right in that uh, border area where all three of those come together. But uh, that one scored in the bottom quarter. And then um, we have a similar list of projects in Division 8 as we did in Region E. Um, it's a little bit shorter list of projects, but the four top scoring are the same with the addition of one additional project at um, NC211 and Rattlesnake in Pinehurst. Um, and then our bottom three projects that scored in, in the bottom quarter were Midland Road improvements, Colon Road improvements, and oh, four projects, excuse me, NC87 north of Pittsburgh, and then um, Ashby Road uh, 42 connector in Lee County. So any questions about the highway projects before we move on to the other modes? All right. So when we look at bike ped, uh, the graph gets a little messy because 
they're obviously only eligible in the division category. Um, we actually didn't have any bike ped projects in division seven, so they are all in division eight. Um, you can see we actually had quite a few bike ped projects score in the top quarter. Um, and I'm just gonna quickly read through them. So it's uh, Wicker Street in Sanford, Third Street in Siler City, Hawkins Avenue in Sanford, McKeever Street in Sanford, Carbonton Road in Sanford, uh, the Aberdeen Downtown Pedestrian Crossings, 7th Street in Sanford, uh, Bragg Street in Sanford, PD Road in Southern Pines, um, some downtown Pittsburgh pedestrian crossings, East 3rd and North 10th in Siler City, North 2nd and Cottage Grove in Siler City, and East 3rd and North Avenue in Siler City. Those were all the, the top ones. And then at the bottom, in the bottom uh, quarter, we had West Elk in Siler City, Central Drive in Southern Pines, Murdoch's Full Road in Pinehurst, and West Street in Pittsburgh. Um, then when we look at our aviation projects, uh, again, we had quite a few aviation projects that, that scored in the top quarter. Um, this, so this slide is aviation, rail, and transit all sort of combined on one slide. Um, so you can see in the regional impact for both Region D and Region E, the um, Chapel Hill to Pittsburgh bus improvements that were submitted by the Durham Chapel Hill Carborough MPO uh, scored fairly well. The um, S-Line passenger service um, that was submitted by DOT uh, did not score very well. Um, and then when we get over to the division needs categories, um, again, the, the Chapel Hill to Pittsburgh bus service that was submitted by the MPO uh, scored fairly well. The um, micromobility vans and additional bus that were submitted by um, Orange County Transit and Chatham Transit uh, did not score very well. And then we have a number of airport projects in the Division 8 category that, uh, that scored pretty well. So any place where it says SOP, that's the Moore County Airport. They're, they're kind of listed by their airport codes on this chart. Um, SCR would be the Siler City Airport, and TTA is the Raleigh Executive Jet Port in Lee County. Um, so there's four projects at the Moore County Airport, one at the Siler City Airport, and one at the Lee County Airport that um, scored in the top quarter, and then uh, three at the Lee County Airport that scored in the bottom quarter. So any questions? Matt, just a, I guess, overarching thing, because this is my first time going through a process like this and then having this process get canceled and or whatever we're calling it. Um, so <clears throat> if I'm looking at things like this, in terms of takeaways, would I be most interested in seeing, for example, what's on the slide here, uh, like the Chapel Hill to Pittsburgh bus? Is that something that come around next time should be at the top of my list because of the fact that it's in the top quarter? Um, does it automatically get rolled over? Could you just maybe speak to like what going from a, a spot five to six, or in this case, a six to seven might look like for those of us who haven't done it before? Yeah, so it, I, I will say right now, a, a lot of things are still very unclear about sort of how things are going to transition from six to seven. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful we will have some more guidance on that within the next month or so. Um, and I'll be able to talk a little more uh, clearly about that at our February meeting. But in general, uh, the, the takeaway I would take from today's discussion is things that scored in that top quarter are projects we should definitely think about resubmitting again next time. And, and making sure that we're we're um, planning to that planning to move to move ahead with pushing those ones. The projects that scored in the bottom quarter are the ones that we really need to think about, and and that becomes a question of maybe 
it's something that's really important and we we want to say yes we know it's not going to score well but we're going to submit it anyway because it's it's important to us and we want to make sure it's in there that that's an option just knowing that if it didn't score well this time it's probably not going to score well again next time um the second option is to take those projects and say is there something we could do to change them to improve them could we you know slice them up into into segments could we combine them together with other projects you know are there things we could do to try to improve their scores um, before we submit them again next time and then the third option is to say you know this is a project that didn't score well it's not that high of a priority for us and we're okay with just letting it drop and not be submitted next time so that's sort of uh the discussions that i would be having the, the discussions and thoughts I'd be having behind the scenes to, to think about preparing for the next time we do a project submittal list. And I will say right now, I don't know exactly when that is going to take place. I think it is likely that we will have those discussions in 2023, uh, but that is not set in stone, so. That's great. And, and <clears throat> I guess one more thing, um, I figured that would be the case, so I, I appreciate your reaffirmation on that. With regards to projects that maybe fell more towards the median or in like the lighter gray box, is your instinct maybe that there's an opportunity there to, to also do what you had just mentioned to maybe play around with some of the inputs to see if we could do a, a, a better score as opposed to stuff that definitely fell in the bottom quarter that we're like, yeah, you're, you're not doing so hot one way or another. Yeah. No, okay. and anything that falls in the gray box, I think, is is fair game for for rethinking as well, okay. uh, because realistically, again, we don't know where the cut score would have been, but I think anything that's not in the top quarter probably would not would not have theoretically been funded, most likely. Great, thank you, appreciate it. Hey, Matt, Tom, that was a good point. I want to build off of that. Uh, you don't have to do this today. You might get share it with us afterwards. Um, the scoring method for Spot 6.0 so that uh, as we make some updates to our projects, what, what are, what are the, the keys? You know, is it connectivity? Is it traffic? What, what are those, uh, the scoring method behind it that might help us uh, strengthen our projects? Yep. I can do that. And I've got another one I, I want to ask. It's not necessarily related directly, but it's indirect. Um, we've got a project that we've went through a corridor study with on Chatham Avenue. It doesn't score very well. Uh, we've got pedestrians walking down the road. It's a you know heavily traveled area. It's got a couple of uh, uh, low income neighborhoods. It connects to downtown. It's between, there's a school. So there's a lot of traffic there in the morning time. And then we've got people walking down the street and I talked to the law enforcement folks about it. And they believe the pedestrian has some um, protection. And I just wanted to know if there was others that could share with me or show me the law where the pedestrians have protection to walk down the road. And when traffic is meeting each other, they don't have anywhere to go. They either run over to pedestrian or they cross the yellow line and hit an oncoming vehicle. Um, what's, the, what's the law and standard there? So I can sort of continue to have that conversation um because i'm concerned about the pedestrians so um others feel free to chime in but i do know there was a change to the law a few years ago regarding bicycles i don't know if it also applied to pedestrians but there was a law a change to the law regarding bicycles saying that uh, cars are required to give them at least three feet of space when they pass them and the cars are permitted to cross the yellow line to pass them. Um, I don't know if that same kind of stuff applies to pedestrians or not, but I would think it might. And Matt, if we don't get uh, some information, maybe this could be a topic for discussion um, for a future meeting. I'd be interested in, in hearing more about uh, the, the, you know, that, and then it would be informational, right? Then I could share information with the public about, you know, what 
what protection a pedestrian has walking on the street. Yep. You know how that section is. There's no shoulders. Uh, that's why they're walking on the road. They would be in the ditch if they um, if they were off the street. Yeah. Are you talking mainly about the section north of the bridge? Yes, sir. Yeah. Between the railroad and the bridge. Yep. <clears throat> Are there any other questions or comments? Hey, Matt, this is Joel. I know you said you don't have a lot of info about 7.0 yet, but all indications are right now that they'll still rescore projects through 7.0. This it's not going to be based on these scores. Yeah, 7.0 would be based on new scoring, so it would not be based on these scores. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, a lot of what sort of remains up in the air is in terms of questions of what um, what projects from from P6 and, and really from previous rounds um, would be qualified to sort of automatically carry forward versus ones for, for rescoring versus ones we have to resubmit for scoring. And a lot of that's sort of still undetermined. So, Matt, did you make the table that was in the packet? Yeah. Okay. Um, is it possible to add which jurisdiction it's in? I could. It... Yeah, I could do that. Um, and then you said some, some were RPO and some were MPO? So um, some, you know, because most of them were projects that we submitted as our RPO, but some of them were submitted by others. So it may have been submitted by the MPO and it just crossed into us. It may have been submitted by uh, one of the division offices for DOT. It may have been a carryover project from P5. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of sources for where the projects came from. Okay. Because we don't know which ones they're going to resubmit. You know, so I'm just trying to think of where if they submitted it this time and it scored well, should we consider submitting it or if they're going to submit it, is that needed? Yeah. I, I mean, I would hope that, you know, if, if, if they're looking at it and saying they, they submitted it this time, that they would look at it and see it had a high enough score or a low enough score that they'd be going through a similar sort of uh, discussions on their end. But uh, you're right, we don't know. So when we do get around to 2023 and we're, we're having these discussions, we'd probably wanna circle back and, and just ask those folks like, hey, these are projects you submitted in the past. Are you thinking about submitting them again? Or we're thinking about maybe we could submit them and, and sort of have those conversations. And I will say, um, there have definitely been times in the past that, uh, you know, say division eight would submit a project in one round, and then we would turn around and submit that project the next time around, because we saw it as, as something we wanted to submit. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. And, and when in 23, you think that that's going to be again? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> <Okay>. Um, <laughs> I mean, 2023 is kind of a guess based on assuming they would like to get back to a two-year cycle of doing these, which I think is what they want. Um, then I think we're probably looking at like summer 2020, 2023 is when we would uh, be doing the, the project submittals. But again, that is all entirely up in the air right now. So is there like zero chance of any of these being funded? Because I thought there was talks about some federal. So um, I can tell you that there is zero chance of anything that was submitted as a new project for prioritization six 
Um, there is zero chance of any of those being in the step. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for the information. Does any, anyone else have any more questions? All righty. We will move on to item 6B, which is discussion of infrastructure, investment, and jobs act. Is that you, Matt? Yep, that's me. Um, just make a note here for myself. All right, so um, just wanted to kind of give you all a brief high level information about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, this otherwise known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill. Uh, so sometimes you'll call it, see it called the, B, the BIB, sometimes it's the IIJA, they're the same thing. Um, it was passed on November 15th. Um, it provides a little over 400 billion for continuation of various existing programs. So sort of continuing the baseline funding and then uh, 550 billion in new or additional funding. Uh, and it does cover five years. Um, so for tra the transportation part of it, um, the existing funding is basically the, the funding that would be a continuation of the previous uh, federal funding, which was the FAST Act. Um, and out of the 550 billion in new funding, 284 billion of that is for transportation. So when you combine that existing transportation and the new transportation together, you get a little over 500 billion total for transportation. Um, the remainder of the funds involved in this are for various other kinds of infrastructure like water and um, energy and resilience and, and various other things. Um, and based on the formula funds, so this is not counting any of the competitive grant funds that are included, but just on the formula funds, NCDOT should get about $8 billion uh, in formula funds, which is about a 29% increase in their uh, guaranteed federal funding. So one question that I, I know folks are probably going to ask is, okay, if NCDOT is getting 29% more federal funding now than they used to, does that solve the problem with the STIP? And, and does that mean that we, we don't have such, such a big problem with the STIP? And the answer that I have heard from DOT is that it certainly helps with the STIP, but it does not fill the entire hole. So there is still a shortage in terms of sort of what's currently in the STIP and then the revenues that are available. So that that's that's the answer that I'm hearing from DOT. It helps, but it doesn't fill the entire um, the hole in the funding. Uh, so this is just a breakdown um, of the the chart on the left is the total amount of new funding, and you can see that. Uh, transportation is the big blue box at the bottom. It makes up the, the largest share of the new funding. And then on the right, you can see sort of what types of projects that new funding will be going towards. So uh, the largest share of it, 110 billion goes to roads and bridges. Uh, the next largest of uh, 66 billion goes to rail. Um, and then third, you're getting down to a much smaller piece uh, is transit at 39 billion and then a variety of other things that, uh, that all receive smaller amounts. Um, there are a number of changes to the competitive grant programs uh, that are offered, um, including a lot of new uh, grant programs. So I'm gonna quickly try to run down this list. I don't know a whole lot of details about this, but I can probably get information about these if anybody's interested. Um, there is Safe Streets for All is a new grant uh, that's focused on safety, uh, particularly for uh, bike, ped, transit, that type of stuff. Um, RAISE is the program that used to be called Tiger and then was called Build, and now it's called RAISE. Uh, that is uh, grants that are typically used by um, 
local governments that apply for them. Sometimes the state does, but it's more typically local governments. Um, and it's typically for uh, sort of uh, holistic, com complete street and, and, and that type of stuff. Um, Infra is a grant program that's specifically towards freight projects um, that's expanded. Um, expanded money for FTA bus grants and high capacity transit capital investment grants, um, a new program for uh, airport terminals, a, a new program for so-called mega projects. Um, and that's really focused on particularly on multi-state projects or multi-region projects. Um, the PROTECT program is a new grant that is uh, specifically looking at resilience issues. Um, there's expansion of grants for port infrastructure, a new grant for ferries, a new grant for nationally significant bridges, uh, a new grant for improved station accessibility for ADA purposes, like things like um, you know, escalators and stuff at, at transit stations. Um, a new grant for charging and fueling infrastructure for vehicles. Uh, a new grant called the Reconnecting Communities Pilot Program um, that is focused on uh, areas where a, a freeway or an interstate or something like that was built through a community and they are now interested in removing that freeway and replacing it with, uh, you know, surface level regular streets. Um, Expansion of uh, the grants for federal land programs and tribal programs, a new grant for SMART grant, and I honestly don't remember what that one is for, um, and then a new grant for rural surface transportation. And before we get too excited about what rural means, um, their definition of rural is anything that is um, either outside of an urban area or in an urban area with less than 200,000 people. So that, that's a pretty, uh, pretty low bar for defining what rural means. So um, there's also a couple of changes that affect formula funding. And, you know, this is probably getting a little down in the weeds, but it creates a new funding band for sub allocations of STBG funding. So what that means, STBG is the sort of largest pot of money that goes towards what we typically think of as normal, you know, uh, road kind of funding. Um, and the law requires that DOT sub allocate that so that they spend um, a certain percentage of it in areas based on their size. So they have to look at the percentage of population in the state that falls into these different population categories, and then they have to divide up their money into those areas based on those percentages. So there used to be three bands. It used to be um, areas with more than 200,000, and then rural and areas with less than 5,000, and then everything else in the middle. So everything between 5,000 and 200,000. They have now split that middle band into um, at 50,000. So there's one for five to 50, and then there's a separate band for 50 to 200. And what that essentially means is that before the RPO areas and the smaller MPOs were competing against each other for that middle pot, and now it's separated out so that you know there's a separate pot for essentially the RPO areas versus the, the smaller MPO areas. Um, and it also increases the amount that is set aside for TAP. That's the Transportation Alternatives Program. That's the money that is typically used to pay for bike ped projects. Um, so it sets aside more, more money for that. And then one last little uh, tidbit that's sort of buried in there is the designation of US 421 between Greensboro and Dunn as a high priority corridor. Um, so this is, um, for those of you who've been around for a little while, you may remember a few years ago, we had uh, some folks come in and do a presentation for us about the idea of um, 
converting this corridor to a future interstate. Um, and we passed a resolution of support for that idea back in 2019. Um, well, this designation as a high priority corridor in the law is essentially a first step toward getting that corridor later designated as a future interstate. So I don't know a whole lot more about the mechanics of how that works. This is this is pretty much the extent of my understanding of it, but um, that's sort of a, a first step. And I believe that is all that I have on that item. Yes. So any questions? Matt, this is Jack. I got one. Um... There's a long ways to go to getting uh, that getting 421 turned into an interstate. Um, through the spot process, is there ways that we put together projects that help us build toward that? Um, get making that happen. Uh, I, you know, we don't have any interstates. Well, I don't think of. There's no interstates in. Is there any in Tarpa? Nope. Yeah, so this would be a first for us, kind of uh, getting interstate funding, I guess, or funding for for an interstate. Yeah. So, um, and and I will say we we did try to submit some projects for P six. Uh, so what we did we did start down that path of trying to get some projects on the list. But there is, like you said, there is a lot of work that is going to have to be done to actually make this uh, into an interstate corridor. And, uh, you know, I, I hate to say that it's easy, but comparatively, it is going to be much easier to do the section between Greensboro and Sanford, uh, where there's already, you know, a pretty high quality four lane road in place and there's relatively few driveways. Um, it is going to be relatively easier to do there than it is going to be east of Sanford, where there really is no existing uh four lane high quality corridor um and you know i don't know that there's even really been much thought yet in in on the harnett county side of things because you know they're not in our rpo so i don't know but i don't even know that there's been much thought about sort of what this looks like on that side so um there's a lot more work to do there Any more questions um, for Matt? Hi, Matt. This is Brandon. I, I've got a question for you about that list of uh, grants, uh, new grant programs that you had pulled up. It, have they released more information about um, how administratively those will be um, worked out? Like if you know they'll be uh, applied for through RPOs and MPOs, if it'll be through the state, if the ones that are specifically for local governments right, are applying directly into these programs, uh, is that information available? So for the ones that are existing programs, so all the ones that say expanded instead of new, um, you should be able to make those assumptions based on sort of the way they work currently. Um, but for all those new programs, they have not released any kind of uh, guidance or, or information yet. Um, and, and, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it's, you know, six months or a year before we, we get much information about that. Thank you, Matt. Yep. Any more questions for Matt? Okay. Um, and it looked like Brian, oh, Jack responded. Okay, I wanted to make sure Jack saw that chat from Brian on the bike and ped laws. Um, All righty, so we'll move on to the S, is it S line? Yeah. S line transit oriented development study kickoff. All right. So, this is a pretty quick item, but I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of it. Um, so, NCDOT is doing a study on the potential for transit oriented development around potential station locations on the S line corridor. Um, and I have a map on the next slide that'll show you where that is. But the S line is uh, a north-south rail line that is owned by CSX and it passes kind of right through the center of our region. Um, NCDOT is in negotiations right now with CSX on 
purchasing the section of the S line that is north of Raleigh. So um, CSX, CSX actually sold the Virginia section of this line to the state of Virginia, I wanna say like a year or two ago. Um, so Virginia already owns their section of this corridor. Uh, and now North Carolina is trying to purchase their section, at least for the part north of Raleigh. Um, I think there's still talk about what might eventually happen with the line south of Raleigh, but uh, CSX uses the section south of Raleigh a lot more than they use the section north of Raleigh. Uh, north of Raleigh, it's currently a dead end. Um, and so it's only getting just the local um, freight service. Whereas south of Raleigh, it is still a through line. So it does get uh, more train traffic on it. But apart from sort of which sections uh, NCDOT might end up buying, uh, NCDOT is looking at this entire corridor as a potential corridor for where they could implement future commuter rail service, um, both north and south of Raleigh. And so they have set up this transit-oriented development study to look at potential locations where there might be stations in the future and look at what sort of transit-oriented development um, opportunities there are around those. And so one of the areas that's being examined as part of the study is in Sanford. And you can see on the screen uh, the map of sort of which sections of the line are included in that study. Um, they, they're they still fairly early in the process. Um, they just recently had their kickoff meeting with the sort of high level uh, folks. Uh, I believe that was in October maybe, or might've been in November, but it, it, it was fairly recently. Um, and they're, they're kind of aiming to complete this uh, study by the end of 2022. So we expect there'll be uh, some more meetings and, and uh, public outreach and things happening over the course of the next year. Uh, and that's pretty much all the information I have on that. I do uh, think I included a copy of the newsletter that, uh, that NCDOT sent out about the S-Line in your packet. Yeah. Alrighty. Any questions about the S line? So is that they started with several options, right? On locations? Because I think I remember seeing a map that looked different than that at one point. Does it seem like this is more of um well so they had gone out so this is a, a grant funded uh, study and they had gone out, I guess it was probably about a year ago uh, to contact various local jurisdictions and sort of find out which ones were interested in participating. And so Sanford was, was one of the ones that agreed to, to participate. Um, so I believe oh. that, that the city of Sanford is actually providing part of the match to the grant. Oh, gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. So now it's more of just getting input on it, um, on the final, I guess, proposal. And, you know, I, I, the, this is sort of early enough in the conceptual stages that there's, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of, you know, what, what does uh, commuter rail service in this quarter even look like? You know, a lot of that sort is, is, is still very much up in the air. So uh, I, I think part of this study is to try to look at what the opportunities are and then think about based on those opportunities, what kind of makes sense uh, from a potential service perspective. Okay. Any, any additional questions? All right. Uh, last discussion item is uh, step updates. All right, we've only got a few of these. Um, there were three um, listed in November and none in December. So we have a one-year delay on the Chatham Parkway North project um, that is pushing right-of-way to fiscal 23 and construction to fiscal 24. Um, we had some added funding to a 
Orange County Transit Vehicle Purchase. Um, I believe that was mainly, I'm trying to remember now. I think that was involving MPO funds maybe, um, but I can't remember for sure. And then um, they created a project section break on the US-1 uh, Super Street project in Southern Pines and Aberdeen to allow them to begin the uh, waterline relocation portion of that project. Any comments or questions on that? All right. Number seven on the agenda, member updates. Does anyone have anything they would like to share or discuss with everyone? Uh, this is Julie. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, go back and do a, a little bit more of an introduction of uh, Natasha Henderson. Um, so she's a new transportation engineer uh, with the transportation planning division. Uh, she is observing today, but we'll be working with uh, Pittsburgh on their CTP amendment. And um, she will also be the coordinator, our coordinator for the Goldsboro MPO, Eastern Carolina RPO and the Peanut Belt RPO. And uh, she graduated from NC State and we are happy to have her on our team. Yes, very happy. <laughs> for us especially. <laughs> uh, Teresa, this is Jack. Uh, we hired our first planner with the town uh, to work, you know, beside me in the department. His name is Dylan, or excuse me, Dalton York. Uh, Matt, I, I plan on continuing, this is going to continue to be my role, uh, but if I happen to be absent, uh, how could we set it up for Dalton to be my alternate? Um, just send me an email asking me to, to make that change on the roster. Yeah. Who's the current alternate? Uh, for you, you don't have one. Okay. I'll send that to you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Well, uh, we will meet again on Thursday, February 10th. Right, Matt? That is Absolutely. correct, assuming that the yeah. <laughs> RTAC approves that calendar. Right. And we'll figure out later if it's going to be virtual or not. Yes. Okay. Well, unless anyone has anything else, we will recess the meeting until noon. Yes. And just as a reminder, uh, because this is a little different from what we did in the past, we do have a separate link for the second meeting this time. So I will be turning off this one and then you will have to use the other link for the second meeting. I think this worked out really well. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I know we've had issues or I've had issues in the past with Teams. So I liked the Zoom option. All right, well, thanks, Matt. I'll see you in a little bit. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you both. See you in a bit. Okay, bye.